Good afternoon and welcome to LVS Perspectives 13, Gambling Addiction, the blurred lines between gambling and gaming. And today we're really honoured to have Patrick Foster from EPIC Risk Management with us. Um, I first heard Patrick speak a couple of years ago at a boarding schools conference and um, I really was blown away by his story. It's extremely powerful. So Patrick, welcome to LVS. I'm going to pass over to you. Um, there are, you can send your questions through parents uh, through on the live chat or if you want more anonymous question to come to me only I have my phone here you can come through on my school email which is on the Facebook chat Patrick over to you uh, thanks very much um, I'm just going to share my screen thanks very much for for logging in tuning in uh, this morning giving up some of your time um, it's great to be back at LVS I'm here to talk, as you just heard, about a pretty important topic, a hot topic. It's something that's in the media at the moment. It's something that you need to be very aware of as, as parents or indeed as, as young people who participate in these things. I'm going to spend the first part of the session um, sharing with you my own personal story, my own personal experience, because I think it will help put into context why I do what I do now um, and then go on to talk about why um, this is so important. So in terms of who I am, why I'm here, why I do what I do now, I am actually a former professional cricketer. I played professional cricket for Northamptonshire between 2002 years of my life, living my dream as a full-time paid professional athlete. I'm also a former teacher. I spent seven years in independent education, teaching at two of the country's most well-known famous prep schools, knowing that will probably shock and surprise you even more when you hear what you're about to. I was also very fortunate in my education. I make no bones about it. I went to one of the top independent boarding schools in the country. I was afforded every opportunity you could possibly imagine. And one of the regrets I have in life more than anything else is that I didn't make the most of the opportunities that were given to me. But the main reason I'm here, the main reason I do what I do now and share my story with thousands of people on a weekly basis is that 972 days ago, just over two years ago, I found myself on the end of a train platform, 90 seconds away from doing the unthinkable and throwing myself in front of a moving train. The reason I was about to do that was I'd been battling addiction for 13 years, in the main part an addiction to gambling. An addiction that, like it always does, starts as a bit of fun developed into a habit, became a problem, and in the latter days, an addiction. An addiction that I had no issue whatsoever recognize, recognizing because of the things that I was doing, the situation that I was in. My problem was that actually I was too embarrassed and ashamed to do anything about it. I was so worried what people would say or think. I didn't know where to get help, and I didn't think help was possible. And actually, one of the messages I want to get across to young people and indeed adults more than anything else is that whoever you are, you might be faced with a problem in your life, however big, however small, that you try really hard to deal with yourself, but actually you can't. Reaching out for help, telling somebody is the best thing you'll ever do. So just in terms of a bit of background, uh, as I said, when I was 13, I got a scholarship to an amazing school where I'd spent five very happy years. Sport was my passion. It always had been. I played in all the major sports teams, uh, I was a school prefect, might not seem like the biggest thing in the world, but what it does show is that when I was 18 years old, I didn't do anything wrong. I was kind of your perfect model pupil. I wasn't the brightest in the world, I don't pretend to be, but I worked incredibly hard. I left school with two A's and a B at A level. Hard to believe, I know, but I had a girlfriend or two who was quite popular. Didn't really have to deal with any challenges or failures. And I look back on my time at school, and weirdly, one of my biggest regrets or what I wish more than anything else is more had gone wrong because if I'd learned to fail at school, I might have learned to fail in the real world. So much so that when I was 15 years old, my dream came true. I got offered a place on the Northamptonshire Academy. I'd spend five, uh, four years at school combining my studies with preparing for a life in professional sport. The day I left school, most people went off to university or gap years, not me. I signed a two year professional contract and started to play cricket for a living that first summer, things went unbelievably well. I got called up into the England under-19 team. I was playing with guys that have gone on to have hugely successful careers, and I thought that was going to be me. 
But then at the end of that year, I also had a dilemma, a difficult decision because I'd been made, I'd been offered a place, uh, Durham, to read history and politics. I didn't really want to go to university now to tell the truth. But I also recognised with the sort of guidance from my parents that professional sport is unbelievably competitive and cutthroat. I had the opportunity to have something to fall back on if I needed it, either during my career or uh, when it had finished. And I arrived at university in October 2006. I'm obviously here to talk to you about a gambling addiction. I haven't mentioned it yet. The reason I haven't mentioned it yet is because unlike a lot of young people nowadays, gambling wasn't part of my life until I was 19 years old. In fact, I can honestly say I'd never placed a bet in my life. My gambling journey started at university on a Saturday morning when I went into a betting shop with some mates. I put two pounds in a roulette machine not thinking anything of it, put it all on the number green zero because it was different from all the others and it was the last number to come up. And in 12 seconds, my life changed because that happened. I won. I spent the next five and a half hours that afternoon in that betting shop. I walked out that night with 250 pounds cash from two pounds and I thought, you know what, that was fun. That was easy. I can make loads of money from this. I had no idea a gambling addiction existed. I had no idea about the dangers, pitfalls, consequences of gambling. I had no idea that over the course of the next 13 years, between the ages of 19 and 31, my life had become taken over by this thing. I'd have three worlds that I'd try and keep separate from each other, compartmentalized, used to the advantage of one another. At first, because I wanted to. In the latter days, because I had to. But unfortunately, these three worlds, like for any addict, would grow closer and closer together. My three worlds would crash and collide in a quite unthinkable way in March 2018. First world was this, my career, my professional life. Whilst I was at university, I had a lot of time on my hands. I had 10 hours of lectures a week. I had to go to the gym every day and I had to go to the nets. But other than that, I had time and I was bored. And I combated boredom by spending that time in shops betting, playing on games. But I also had the money because I was paid to play cricket. I had more money than most students. Therefore, I didn't think it was a problem if I lost my money and did what everybody else was doing. I went back to Northamptonshire after my first year at university. Unfortunately, I'd picked up an injury. Like some people, I'm not good when I'm bored. I hate having an idle mind. And being bored is the worst possible thing for a sportsman or woman. And I couldn't cope with it. Um, my days were much shorter than everybody else's. I wasn't getting the Russian buzz from playing and I started to gamble more. But then when I got fit again, I now had a distraction. I now didn't want to stay after practice for extra training like I used to because I wanted to get back to the betting shop in time for the horse racing to start or didn't want to get out of bed in the morning. So I've been in casinos all night. And unfortunately, of course, my performance dropped and I ended up getting released. And it hit me really hard because it was the first time in my life that I'd ever been told that I wasn't good enough at something. I didn't really like it. I didn't know how to deal with it. But not just that, combating negative life events or things that go wrong is, is hard. And my way of doing it was to turn to addictive substances or behaviors, not knowing that it would only make the problem worse. I went back to university. I carried on doing all these things. But of course, I still had the time. And I was bright enough to get through my degree. I graduated with a 2-1 in history and politics from one of the best universities in the world. I had a great CV on paper. I moved to London. I lived with mates. We got paid huge salaries. But my problem, unlike everybody else, was I didn't know how to control it. I couldn't resist the four or five betting shops that I'd walk past every time I got off the tube. In December 2010, on the back of hearing that I was getting a promotion, um, I decided to put a big bet on one night. I put a £500 football accumulator um, on uh, six matches where three of the matches, both teams had to score a goal. Real Madrid had to lose and two other results. And in 90 minutes, my life got turned upside down when I won £34,988 off a £500 bet which sounds like the best thing that could ever happen to a 22-year-old guy living in London who liked gambling, but not me when you already have a problem with it because actually it changed my relationship again without me knowing because what happened now is every time I placed the bet, I expected, I thought I was going to win £35,000. When I didn't, don't matter, you're going to win it all back in a minute. And in the short term, it was money I didn't need. 
But perhaps the worst thing about it that I didn't know was now it became like a drug because essentially if I won less money than that, it didn't give me the same feeling. And I started trying to chase that win. I lost that five, I lost that 35,000 pounds that I won that, that night, having not told a soul that I'd won it in the next five weeks. When it had gone, I wanted to try and win it back. And of course, then when I started to lose, I started to deal with these things in ways that I never thought I'd do. I started to take a lot of drugs, drink more, and my life started to go off the rails in a very different direction. And I recognized this and I thought, I've got to go and do something about it. But what on earth do you do about it? Of course, what you do is you go home and see your parents, as I did. In July 2011, I hadn't spoken to my mum for six weeks and put on two and a half stone. I'd taken out three bank uh, loans, two credit cards. I missed my last month's rent payment on my house. And I went home because I thought, you know what, I need to tell my parents. But when I sat down with my parents that afternoon, I could not bring myself to tell them because I was worried about what they'd think. I didn't want to let them down. I didn't want them to be disappointed. Instead, I blamed it on living in London, the lifestyle. I said I wanted to go and do something different because I thought if I went and did something different, it would get rid of the problem. But actually, it didn't. I got a job teaching history and Latin as head of cricket, a very well-known prep school in Oxford, where I'd spend five years before moving to another school where I'd lose my job. For a few weeks, it was the best job in the world because I had a different focus. I'd said to myself, I stopped, but then I split up with my long-term girlfriend who's still living in London. And of course, when you're a 23-year-old bloke and you get dumped by the love of your life and you're heartbroken, you're not going to tell people, you're not going to admit it because that's not what blokes do. You've got to man up. My way of manning up was to escape to my safe place, the most dangerous place I could be in doing all these things. Uh, and eventually, over time, it would just catch up with me in every way possible. Eventually, it would start to affect my professional life in so many different ways. Um, of course, I couldn't do the job properly, but mainly financially, because what I started to do was I started to approach parents of pupils I taught for money out of desperation. I knew that lots of these people were very wealthy people. I told them lies. They wanted to help somebody out that they liked and respected. They lent me the money thinking that I'd pay them back and I couldn't. Um, I gambled it all away and I'd eventually get found out. Rightly so. Three incredibly successful careers or potentially successful careers ruined by my relationship with gambling. My second world through all this is my family. These are the most important people in my life. I love and care about these people more than anyone else on the planet. But for 13 years, I didn't. 13 years, I was the most selfish person you could possibly imagine. I was a liar. I was a thief. I was a manipulator. I stole the equivalent of about £75,000 from my dad, either directly by going into his drawers and nicking cash through his bank cards, indirectly by ringing him up saying, can I have some money for this, money for that, like you do. The only thing I needed money for was to put in a roulette machine or on a horse, but only I knew that. I made the mistake of thinking problems like this don't happen to people like me. It happens to people from broken homes, dysfunctional family backgrounds, troubled circumstances. And I always thought these people would be able to wave a magic wand. But actually, I found out the hard way that addiction doesn't, it doesn't discriminate. This is the first thing that most people lose, the hardest thing to ever get back. My third world throughout this was my biggest world, of course, gambling. Over the course of 13 years, I transacted just shy of £2 million worth of bets online. Probably double that when you take into account casinos, betting shops all around the UK and all around the world. I was a VIP member of seven different online operators from the age of 23 that could give me tickets to any sporting event in the world that I wanted. But I now realize that actually it wasn't as glamorous as it sounded because I had to be losing £30,000 a year with any of those to qualify for that status. When I finished, I had 19 different online accounts. But at one point, I had 76 different online accounts in 65 different people's names. I had 23 different bank and payday loans or credit cards. Some of the payday loan companies I borrowed money from, I borrowed £100 off them and I paid back in excess of £6,500, £7,000 because of the interest rates that they charge you when you don't pay them back for 10 years. And once those had run out, I borrowed money from 113 different individual people. The smallest amount of money I borrowed was 75 quid. The biggest amount of money, £28,000. Over the course of 13 years, I'd borrowed just shy of half a million pounds. 
that I now have to spend every day for the rest of my life paying back. But actually, forget the money. The worst bit about it was how I felt. I hated myself. I hated the world. I hated everything I was doing. I was suffering from serious mental health issues, anxiety, depression, insomnia. I didn't sleep through the night for 10 years, didn't go to bed because I was either up in the middle of the night doing it, trying to find money or couldn't sleep because I was so stressed. The toll that that took on me was just enormous. And in March 2018, my biggest fear was finally came reality when I got found out. I got found out when the headmistress had received that many complaints from parents, colleagues, and she basically called me in. They discovered by looking through school emails, school computers, that I owed parents of that school £152,000, which I clearly didn't have. And I got told that I was about to lose my job, my house, and I might be going to prison for fraud. I obviously panicked. I didn't want to tell anybody about the situation I was in. I thought I could get myself out of this problem as always because I thought I was a hero. I thought I could get myself out of this problem with the thing that got me into it by gambling my way out of it. To cut a long story short, I essentially borrowed £10,000 off somebody that I'd already borrowed £3,000 off. During the Cheltenham Festival in March 2018, I managed to turn it into £50,000 but I was going to court the next day and I didn't want anybody to find out. I thought I could win the money back. And I ended up putting a 50,000 pound bet on one horse race, one horse, the Cheltenham gold cup in March, 2018, knowing that if this horse won, I'd win 200,000 pounds. If this horse lost, I had no option, but to kill myself because of the things that I was had done, the situation I was in. And there's no way I was going to admit to people how stupid I've been. I watched this horse race knowing that, my horse is called Mike Bite. It's in black and orange, furthest away from the running rail. I had a £50,000 bet on that horse called Mike Bite that came second by that far. The best thing that ever happened to me in my life was that horse coming second, but it certainly didn't feel like it at the time. To cut another sort of long story short, I got myself through the rest of the day. I took myself home. Um, I didn't know. I'd never planned how I was going to do the unthinkable. I just knew I needed to do it. I collected every pill I had in my house, having been out the night before and got way too drunk. Uh, the following morning, I collected every pill I had in my house. There were 98 different pills, most of them antidepressant sleeping pills. So I collected them all up, started to take them, Googled ones if you do this. It wasn't having any effect on me and Google wasn't giving me the right answer. I picked up my car keys. I went and got in my car. I planned to drive my car off the road. As I was driving round, I knew deep down I wasn't a bad person. I didn't want to kill or injure anybody else. I just wanted this pain to go away. I wanted to start again and have another go at life. Three hours later, I arrived here at Slough Station. I bought a £14.50 travel card with the £18 coins that I had left in the world, and I went and stood on the end of that train platform. I had six minutes for a fast train coming through. It was not going to stop, and I was going to do the unthinkable and throw myself in front of it. I had a lot going through my mind, but thank goodness one thing going through my mind more than anything else is you got to tell somebody. But who'd you tell? After a little bit of thought and for various different reasons, I decided to reach out to my younger brother. I didn't want to call him because I didn't want to break down. I didn't want him to hear me like this at the end. So what I did was I sent him a WhatsApp message basically just saying, this is what I'm about to do, that I wanted him to say sorry to the family and goodbye. Of course, when he didn't reply, which is because he just heard the hardest thing I hope he's ever going to have to hear. My mind was so scrambled, I thought he wanted me to do it as well. He then tried to call me, but my mind was made up. I kept cancelling the calls. But fortunately for me, he then sent me a message and that message saved my life because he said the only thing that was going to stop me doing it because it made me think of other people, not myself for the first time. He basically said, if you do this, I'm not going to be able to cope. He said, nor to the rest of the family. He said, don't you dare. And he said, just talk to me about whatever it is. That's what I needed to hear. I stood there knowing that I had half a million pounds worth of gambling debt. I was about to lose my house, my job, possibly going to prison. I don't lie or exaggerate. It was the first time in 10 years I felt good because I felt an overwhelming sense of relief. I'd finally told someone I had a problem I couldn't deal with. I could get the help I needed. I got myself home. I was greeted at the door of my house by my mum, 
I'm a 33-year-old bloke. I was 31 at the time. I don't mind admitting it. I ran over to my mum because that's what you do. I gave her a hug and I said, I'm sorry. On the Monday morning, I was supposed to go to court, but I didn't. I spent six weeks on Harley Street in London having treatment for an addiction, an addiction that I didn't know existed when I was younger. Certainly didn't think it happened to me. Those six weeks were tough. I had to have a long, hard look at myself in the mirror, take responsibility for everything that I'd done, but also try and understand it and try and understand how I was going to live my life. I now work for an organization called Epic Risk Management. We're a team of recovering compulsive gamblers who share our stories in the hope that it will stop other people going through what we did. But also we want to make this environment safer, fairer, educate people around dangers, pitfalls, consequences. We work with some of the most high profile clients in the world across a huge number of sectors because this is the fastest growing and potentially most devastating addiction. It's incredible that schools now are no longer ignoring these issues, partly because they can't, but also because when I was younger, addiction was all about substances. It was all about alcohol, drugs, smoking to an extent, sex and relationships. But now actually these three things in red are the things that nobody ever used to talk about, but yet possibly the things that are affecting young people more than anything else. And this is why I had a desire to talk about them because I didn't want young people not to know like I didn't. The scale in society of the problem is huge. 450,000 problem gamblers. For every one of those, it affects 10 people. You just heard from my story, I affected a lot more than 10. One in 30 people doing it more than they can afford. One in six in high risk sectors who we specialize our work in. 17 to 24 year olds are arguably the highest risk sector. Not just that, young people. 87% of young people now are gaming every single day, are playing on some form of online game. 14 hours a week is the average amount of time spent. And that's not a statistic that took into account what's going on in the world at the moment. What's terrifying about that is 59% of those people are spending money on these games every day. Um, and 158 pounds is the average amount of money spent on a game. Now, historically you used to go into HMV, buy a game and that's the money you spent, but not now. Now it's all changed. Gaming addiction is a very real thing. Um, gaming addiction is on the increase hugely with young people. Um, I'm here to raise awareness of the dangers of it, but I also need to emphasize that it's not all bad and that actually gaming does actually have a positive effect for many young people. It can be really good in terms of enhancing their critical thinking skills because you've got to think on your feet, finding solutions to problems, event sequencing, it's also an important part of their social development because that's now what young people do. That's how they socialize and that's what their mates do. So actually it's really important. It's something that at the moment they can do. It's a way they can interact with their mates and certain games, things like the Wii and um, other things are very good for coordination and motor skills. But like anything, it's all about moderation and it's all about control. Because unfortunately now with young people, the advent of the online world, particularly online gambling and video gaming, means that it's so accessible. You can now place a bet or play on a game in six seconds on over two and a half thousand different platforms on a mobile phone that everybody lives their whole life on. Therefore, the ease of access is unprecedented. You can do it any time, any place, but also they're brought up in a generation which is about instant reactions instant responses, click of a button stuff. And these things give it to them and that's why it's appealing to them. But actually online gaming is a lot more harmful and dangerous away from just the amount of time and opportunities because of things like loot boxes, skins, packs, microtransactions that young people make every day on these games where they can spend huge amounts of money in a completely unregulated environment. Add to that exposure, 20% of all adverts on TV are gambling adverts. You now got social media influencers who are glamorizing some of these things. 
microtransactions are the things that are dangerous. These are the things that are creating a convergence between gaming and gambling because of the money that can be spent, particularly things like loot boxes, which are essentially forms of gambling because it's normalizing that type of behavior. It's pretty simple. When it comes to any addictive substance and behavior, but gambling more and gaming more than any other, if you never do it, you're never going to have a problem with it. Simple as that. But the second you enter into a relationship with it, you start on a journey. And the more you do it, the more likely you are to develop a problem with it. But also these things and a lot of these games are designed to be addictive. So actually things happen along that journey that make you do it more. And my message to people is that it's about moderation. It's about control. If you ever use an addictive substance or a behavior and it has a negative impact on your life in any way, that's when you need to stop. That's when you need to do something about it. These are some of the signs of the bomb that you can look out for in yourself and indeed other people when it comes to your relationship with these things, but anything that's addictive. And if you start to spot these signs in yourself, you start to display more than one. That's when I recommend that you do something about it. Some of the key messages that are really important is that everybody thinks of gambling, gaming. They think about uh, the sort of physical consequences of them in terms of it's stopping them exercising. It's stopping them doing things. They're not spending any time doing things that they used to do. They're also spending huge amounts of money. People think about those things, but actually the focus needs to be on the way it makes people feel. Um, I was somebody who neglected my mental health for a long time. Um, mental health is no longer a taboo subject. It carries less of a stigma now, which is great. It's being talked about more than ever. But the issue with mental health now is it still carries negative connotations. And actually what we need to teach people and the key thing we need to get across is that everybody has mental health. It's either good or bad or indifferent, and you need to do what you can to make sure you've got good mental health. But some of the other messages up there are really important, and you as parents to try and showcase or model these behaviors is really, really important because they were modeled to me, um, and I think that's really important. Gaming and gambling can impact young people, adults in many different ways, but these are the four ways really that it becomes when it's a problem that you suffer more than anything else. Sleep is something that I now value more than I ever did before because I never used to do it. Um, because I used to be up in the middle of the night playing on these games. I couldn't sleep after I played them. And actually the importance of sleep is, is, is huge. There are people that are more vulnerable to others. Um, I always had an addictive personality. I always saw that as a negative thing. And I now have had to learn that actually that can be positive. Um, some of the most successful people in the world have those characteristics, but actually you just need to channel them in a way. You also need to make sure that you're really careful when it comes to addictive substances and behaviors. Dealing with negative life events, failures is, is one of life's big challenges. And actually using addictive substances for be and behaviors is not a way to ever combat these things, as I found out. But actually, you hear a lot of people say they've had a bad day. What are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to go and have loads to drink. And actually, that's not messages that we should be transcending to the next generation. Because I found out you just start to rely on them. Similarly, if you are somebody or have a son or daughter who's very competitive, please be extra vigilant when it comes to their relationship with these things because both gaming and gambling are essentially drugs for competitive people because they're all about winning and losing. So you get it on tap. And that's why I loved it because I was getting it there and then. But actually my problem was I would never stop when I lost I'd only ever stop when I win. But then, of course, when you win, you love that feeling, so you start chasing it again. My advice to you as parents um, is to be more aware. Um, be more aware of these topics, but also accept that young people are going to do them. When they're so ingrained in culture and society and normalized to the extent that they are, 
you don't have to see them as, as a bad thing, but actually you need to make sure that you have boundaries in place um, and that young people learn to put those boundaries in place themselves, barriers. Some of those are mental, but some of them are physical and practical barriers, making sure that you implement parental controls on any uh, device, make sure that you put um, you don't link up things like credit cards, bank cards to these games because they're addictive. Young people will spend that money. Similarly, be very clear on what they're doing, what they're playing, consistent in your message. Know that if they're playing, you can say, look, I'm happy to do this, but I'm going to check this, that or the other. Because actually, if you're clear and consistent in your message, mixed messaging is very dangerous for young people. Um, that sort of tr transpires in two ways really when it comes to gambling you often have one parent who hates it can't stand it like my mother one parent who my dad who would do it occasionally but whenever he did it he'd say don't tell your mum because she knew he, he knew she hated it and that meant I didn't know who to follow so I just kept it all quiet the other way it can happen is that if you've got one parent who doesn't allow it and then the other does it's, it makes it difficult. So be consistent in your message and talk about these things. They should no longer be taboo subjects. Alcohol isn't a taboo subject, so nor should uh, gambling be and gaming. Let's talk about them. Let's normalize conversations around them and understand that there may come a point where you need to draw the line. You need to say enough's enough and you need to intervene. Don't ignore these things. They're there for a reason, but also just because it has a rating of X, Y, and Z, like FIFA has a Peggy rating of three. Don't just go on those because actually find out what is involved in these games. Don't judge a game by its cover um, because actually it's not always the case. These are some simple do's and don'ts. This will all get shared uh, with the school in terms of lists of these. Some of them more obvious than others. As I said, the don'ts, don't link up cards to accounts um, and then be surprised when you get a big bill through. Try not to um, ignore age restrictions. Um, make sure that you put the barriers in place, set time limits, restrict access, but also allow it, talk about it, lead by example, and talk to each other as parents because they're not easy topics um, and actually find out what other people um, are doing. There's a huge amount of available information out there on, on these things. Um, if you do want to reach out to me because you're concerned about an individual, you want some more advice, whatever it might be, please do. Um, whether that's through the company or, or through my own social media. Um, there's some fantastic books out there. There's a great book around men's mental health by a guy called Charlie Hall called Man Up, which is very easy to read, very practical for young men particularly. Um, there's apps that are great. Mandy Saligari um, is, was my therapist. She was the clinical director where I was treated. She's an incredible woman who's got her own story. Um, she has got some TED Talks that you won't regret watching because they're fascinating, but she's also got a book um, around proactive parenting when it comes to kind of managing addiction. And of course, there's a lot of support out there, um, independent, confidential support. If it's to do with gambling, helplines, websites, if it's to do with gaming, we collaborate with an organization called Game Quitters who are incredible. Um, and of course, places where you can get advice around um, mental health. Um, I hope the last 35 minutes or so has been interesting. Hope it's been informative. I hope a worthwhile use of your time, you can take something from it. Um, I would be absolutely delighted to answer any questions that you might have, whether that's around my own personal experiences, the work that I do now, um, or indeed um, if it's a bit more uh, practical than that. But Thanks very much for listening, um, having me. It's a real pleasure to be working with the school again. So thank you. Thank you, Patrick. That is such a powerful story. And I, 
I said to you just before we came on on the broadcast when I first heard it I remember being at the back of the room in tears and I must admit I did have a little bit of a cry there when you did it again it's hugely powerful because you know we're all mums um, we have children and, and it's so real and it can happen can't it? it can happen to anyone so thank you for sharing that it can't be easy for you either and you're having some lovely messages coming through and one saying you know thank God for your brother you know <laughs> what a wonderful brother um, yeah. and 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 you know it, it saved you in the in the situation what a lovely family you have and that relief when you saw your mum I think that's just incredible because I think as mums it doesn't matter what our children have done we just we just want them with us and to be happy um, and lots of thanks coming through um, so such an important message thank you for sharing with us this is so interesting to listen to one mum saying here that she's glad she's the mean mum who deleted Fortnite after four weeks um, and doesn't let him play spend money on games although there is huge pressure there I think as from parents with you know peer pressure from from children as well so if anybody's got any experiences about that or question uh, please send it through the chat and also I've got my email on here at school people are coming through on my school email if you would rather not go on the chat as well um, lots of lovely messages saying thank you for sharing your personal experience in such a compelling way you demonstrate how frightening easy it is for anyone to become addicted and how these things can escalate beyond control and a couple of interesting comments are coming through about ages watching this presentation because we're, we're aiming this for our year 10 upwards in school because of it is it is so mightily powerful but a year six parents have said to the junior head of the junior school maybe year six should be exposed to this presentation or the content within it can I ask what what you think yeah I mean it's it's something that I'm obviously very aware of um, and having been a teacher uh, and taught young people, kids under the age of 13, really, year eight and below, um, I understand um, it's, it's, a, it's a fine line. You've got to get the balance right. I think um, in terms of the kind of hard hitting nature um, of my talk and, and some of the topics that are covered, I would say that there is um, a kind of age limit to that. I wouldn't share my story in its entirety talk about topics such as uh, kind of suicide to to pupils much younger than than kind of year nine and, and ten um but i think in terms of some of the content and some of the messages um i think it's really appropriate for those topics to be tackled um from a much younger age um in my opinion the idea or concept around mental health needs to be introduced to young people at a very early age um, and learn a the importance of mental health um, and also the the kind of some strategies that they can use to um, make sure that they have good mental health and they improve what what they do around gaming this message is is so um, relevant because uh, that's what they're doing the convergence between gaming and gambling tends to happen at a kind of 13, 14, possibly more like 16 kind of age. Um, but of course, with gaming, harm exists in, in different ways in terms of kind of time and opportunity. So I think the messages are, are very relevant, even for younger people. They just need to be made sure that they're delivered in a way that is kind of age appropriate. Um, one thing I'm always very, very conscious of it is kind of unintended consequences in, in terms of with young people exposing them to stuff that they, they can't quite sort of comprehend yet. But at the same time, there's an education piece in that because some of these words get branded about by young people and, and making sure that they understand them is, is really important. So very, very important topics for anyone of any age just need to make sure they get delivered in, in an age appropriate manner. Um, on that, Patrick, if, if your company can offer age appropriate uh, training as such, I think we as a school, with seeing the, the comments that are coming through, and for junior school parents who are probably now really quite worried, now their children are coming year six up to year seven and all that comes with it. So if you do have age appropriate training, can we take this offline and we maybe arrange that for some yeah, of our Yeah, absolutely. Children? I mean, yeah. we'd be delighted to do it. It's something that we're, we're, asked, we're being asked to do more. Um, and actually what we have just done 
because for exactly that reason, um, as a company, lived experience, personal stories is, is at the heart of everything that we do. Um, but it needs to be relatable. And we, we've got a young guy now, he's 21 years old, who has experienced harm, both mentally and financially, through simply through video games. Um, and he now does some work. Um, he shares his story and it's, it's very relatable because um, actually that's how a lot of the, these young people will do. So, um, yeah, I'd be delighted to do that. And, and some of the content um, that I'll share on the back of this, some of the resources I'll share with Christine, um, there is one specifically aimed at, at video gaming. So it does talk about that. So, um, yeah. That's brilliant. I mean, so many parents are coming through saying that it needs to be shared with them because, you know, online gaming in particular is much of their part of their lives, especially during lockdown. And, you know, my own children, what what else are they doing? As you say, you can there's only so much walking and sport you can do um, during lockdown. So it, it is resorting to games. And a parent saying that, that she would like her year seven to hear this message. So it's something we'll pick up afterwards. I think it's really important and we'll move forward quickly on that one. OK, if we can. That sounds good, yeah. Yeah. If there's any more comments or questions from Patrick, I'm just going to quickly check my phone screen. There's nothing coming through on my email. I don't think there's any more. Um, there's a couple of comments which I'd like to share with you. Really moved by your story. Thank you for sharing. Inspire, inspiring, Patrick. Lockdown has meant our 10-year-old son has gone from hardly any computer time and games to increasing time playing games for social interaction. Yes, I would welcome an appropriate message to Year 6. Brilliant. And I think the gaming one is important. All our kids are doing it. Fabulous. This has been a great session, Patrick. Thank you so much. Um, talk to you soon. Yeah, and uh, we'll arrange that. And, and best wishes to you and your family. I hope you have a lovely Christmas. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me, everyone. And, and good luck. Thank you. Bye. So just, bye bye. Just before we disappear, I'm going to give you a quick update on what's happening in, in school at the moment and what we've been up to as well. So the children are in football shirts today, raising money for the Bobby Moore charity for research into bowel cancer, which is absolutely fabulous as well. Uh, last week, we mentioned that we had the guest, the LVS um, joint age group. And this, and this was fascinating how we got so close. So. The overall uh, years were 16,098 years, four months and 27 days. And our winner, the adult winner, Mrs. Reed, was so close. Look at this, 16,064 years, two months and 26 days. And she's actually sh um, shown us how she worked it out. So if you're interested, contact Claire and she's agreed that we can send that on to you. And then Harley Jackson in year five, our pupil winner along with his granddad, 16,000 years, zero months, zero days. So fabulous. And overall, we raised uh, for children in need what with the mufty days and the children in the junior school doing chores and the duck race we raised a staggering 1926 pounds for children in need which is absolutely fabulous absolutely brilliant and then moving on last saturday we had the pta quiz which was a real hoot we had uh, 48 families on online and that raised 480 pounds for the pta it was really really good fun so much so that we're going to be running another one on the 5th of december catering i think we probably nailed it this week after some of the problems that we've had and we've created extra space so years um seven and eight are now in our sports hall which is set up as a dining room and this uh, marquee has been put over the quad area if you can picture that outside the dining room and there's actually sparkly lights in that tree now so the year 11 can sit down at lunchtime and then years nine and ten are in the dining room and the sick form in the sick form block and junior school as they were before. So that seems to be working really well. Everyone's pleased with that. Might need a few heaters in there in the next week or so, but we'll, we'll be fine. OK, and then a little bit more news on the, moving on to the next picture. Um, we sent out a survey yesterday. Thank you for re responding to that really quickly. We've had a fantastic response to it. And just looking at uh, whether how parents felt about learning online for that last week again, because we're not changing our minds in how we're doing it, but the opinion did shift. So the Infinite and Junior School, 80% disagree about online learning in the last week. Years 7 to 9, 67% disagree, which is, um, that's gone up. It was about 49% before, so that's gone up. And bearing in mind, we, we sent it out the day before lockdown before, Years 10 and 11, 70% disagree. That's flown up. And so has year 12 to 13. Um, that's um, gone up as well. So 
parents and pupils seem to be wanting to want to be in school right up to the last. So our intention is we go right up to the last, right up to the December the 11th. And if you want to be in school um, out of year 11 and junior school, you, you are in school, as many children in school as we possibly can. But if you have a personal circumstance, if you have a family issue or if you're worried, then we will grant you online leave um, for that week if you contact us and explain the situation you can have online leave that week because we want to it's a very special time this and more so this year for family reasons so if you've got real strong family reasons for being online in that last week whether it's self-isolation worries whether you've got to travel abroad our borders will probably have to go a bit earlier because of the covid testing they have to go through before they can return home then we are flexible because this is a this has got to be a family time now family christmas but still with our continuity in education as well and then some more exciting news if we go on to the next picture we have a large Christmas tree and it's outside at the main reception and this is just a work in progress. So the tree went up yesterday. We've got a picket fence around it this morning. By Monday, we will have snow on the floor. We will have a sleigh. If we can have the next picture, we can see. Oh, not that one. Well, can we go to the next one then come back? There's a sleigh that has been built by our DT department by Mr. Withers, who's our DT technician, has built this fabulous sleigh that's going to be out there along with a couple of sparkly reindeer, a lit up rocking horse and a tableau. And we are going to have so much fun based around this Christmas tree. If we go back to the previous slide, the art department have made these baubles for every child in the school. And it's the, the, on the back of them, it will say COVID Christmas 2020, which sounds a bit morbid, but that's not the intention. And it's supposed to be a memento for the children that they can take with them. So when their grandparents themselves, their grandchildren will say, grandma, granddad, why does it say that? You can say, well, Christmas 2020 was a little bit different to normal. And we had a big Christmas tree in our, in our school. And we're going to hang these baubles with house coloured ribbons on that tree. We might not be able to get further than about six foot up, but we're going to hang those baubles from the tree as well. So if we move on to the next slide there, there's the sleigh again. And then just some general update, if you can see that on the screen. Um, I'm just going to talk through a little bit here because we want to get as much fun for everybody moving forward to the end of term now. So the infant and junior school will not be going to the local church um, for their Chris Dingle. They are coming up to the Christmas tree and they will have their oranges with their candles and the service will be around the Christmas tree and we will film it so that parents can see that too. And we're going ahead with our boarding Christmas dinner party in the evening. On the 4th of December, I've been talking to our, our chaplain, Father Nathan, who will be given as a reflection service. He will be um, broadcasting that live from Bangor Cathedral. Um, and we will also do that from the Christmas tree as well. And it's a service of reflection and it's to think about all the people that may have been affected during COVID. Some of us have lost grandparents, parents, we've lost friends. There are people that are suffering a little bit right now and it's a, a service of reflection. And so if you would like a mention of somebody that you want, are thinking about right now, we can have, Father Nathan will read out their names. We can light candles by the Christmas tree. And it's just a time for us to reflect on this COVID period. On the same day, we're gonna have a Christmas jumper day, but it's an upcycling Christmas jumper day. So I don't think you've got to go and buy one because the ingenuity here will be how we can upcycle a Christmas jumper from anything you've got in your house. And there will be a prize for senior school and junior school. On the same day, the gym and junior school are gonna collect items for their hampers. And the senior school, we'd like to have a collection for the, the Bracknell Food Bank again. So we will ask on the 4th of December if you, your children could bring in an item of food. And on that same day, we will have our whole school Christmas lunch because we do anticipate that some children won't be here in that, that last week. PTA quiz is on the Saturday night, which will have 50% going towards the PTA and 50% to a local children's present giving service. And then on the 7th, we will have our Christmas concert, our Christmas service, again, live from Bangor Cathedral in the evening and our Christmas tree. And hopefully we'll have our soloists from across the school singing Christmas carols and songs. The PTA raffle will also take place live from LVS. We're getting into the, the, the groove on this online broadcasting and we'll have a Christmas concert online as well. The, the Key Stage 1 Nativity will be filmed on the 10th and on the 11th all the junior school are coming over to see Santa 
we've written a special letter to Santa. He's going to come over to the slate and there will be a PTA gift for all the infant and junior school children. And on the last day of term, we're going to have party food for lunch and have a party, celebrate the end of the year and finish slightly earlier. We, we were going to finish at four o'clock, but we're going to finish at two o'clock on that day. But if you're in extended day, then um, continue to be in school. So what we want to do, as much fun as possible, we'll invite you to all of these events. We will stream them out to you. And we want you to be, a, we are a community and we're coming into Christmas and we've got to keep our spirits up and make this a really good Christmas. So there are a few uh, comments com coming through now. If you've got any questions, got my phone on, put them on the, the chat here as well. So a comment here, the marquee is fantastic for year 11. They are so happy, thank you. That it, it's, it's wonderful. I never thought it could look so good. It's, it's brilliant. You know, it would probably make a permanent uh, thing there because it's so versatile as well. And comments saying, thank you for consulting with us. That's who we are. This is how we can move forward. Um, the baubles are a great idea. Um, it's something that we can take with us and we want everybody to, to take part as well. So don't forget, if you've got anybody you'd like included in that reflection service on the 4th of December, then let us know. So it's in this session, so it will run 12 to 1 o'clock on December the 4th. OK, I don't think there's any more comments coming through now. I think we're, we're virtually done. Thank you very much. Um, I won't see you next week because we don't have a session next week. The next one will be our Christmas reflection. But contact me at any time. Any worries, you know where we are. Um, have a lovely weekend. Bye-bye.